free weights are great, but as you get older, right, maybe we don't want to risk the balance issue, stability, maybe not be able to get back up. And machines have all the safety measures. And so really your, your ability to maximize for minimal risk goes up tenfold. Are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better? Then welcome to my podcast. I'm Bob Nickman, and this is The Exploding Human. Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting-edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges, the brave, the curious, anyone who's out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Hey, welcome to The Exploding Human. My name is Bob Nickman. My guest today is Cody Watkins, and we're going to be talking about physical fitness, nutrition, and vitality. But first, I'd like to invite you to visit my website, theexplodinghuman.com. Over there, you can listen to episodes, read synopses, see photos of my guests. There's a little bio on myself. There's also a YouTube channel where you can listen. That is The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman. As I said, my guest today is Cody Watkins. He has been dubbed the king of transformation. Cody is a renowned online fitness coach who started his uh, fitness path at the age of 15. He's going to talk about how that transpired. And then we're going to talk about his career as a bodybuilder and a very gnarly story about discovering he had a congenital heart condition and the surgery around that and how that changed his life. We also get into some of the specifics about how he trains people and what are the things that anyone can do to improve their physical fitness, their vitality, and their nutrition. I'm going to let him tell you the story. Here he is. This is Cody Watkins. Good morning, Cody. It's so great to meet you, and I've uh, enjoyed reading your bio. I have a bunch of questions, and how are you doing today is my first one. Yeah, I'm doing great, Bob. How about yourself? I am good. I'm good. Every day above ground is a victory, and we all know that. Well, some people don't, but you and I know it. (laughs) Yeah, oh, yeah. So I was reading your bio, and the first thing that kind of jumped out at me, because I was not like this, was that you, at 15, started on a path to uh, uh, health and fitness. Um, I was not that guy, so what happened? How how did that happen? Is that a family thing, or were you like a fat kid? What was going on? Skinny fat. So discomfort is a state of growth, right? So you got to be uncomfortable to make a change. And so I didn't like how I looked. So I was... You know, skinny fat, some of your listeners may be able to relate, but you're not a big person in clothes. But when you take your shirt off, you got man boobs, it jiggles a little bit, right? Not the best look. And that's kind of how I was. So if if I went to tell anyone, uh, oh, I want to lose weight, they're going to look at me like I'm crazy because I'm not big, but I didn't have any muscle. So uh, yeah, I was uncomfortable you know, going swimming. I'd stay under chest deep in the water, all that, you know, like you're going to shower in the locker rooms, you're like running into it. Right. So you can hide in the water real quick. You don't want to be shirtless anywhere. And it wasn't, it wasn't any way to live. Right. So I, I started trying to do some research. Right. But really I, I didn't have a lot of knowledge that young. So it was like three days of a tuna fish diet, you know, all these crazy things and they couldn't stick with didn't work. And then I eventually you know, crack the code, so to speak, for the time. And I started to get more into the ketogenic, the cyclic ketogenic diets. And that's where I finally got my body fat down a bit. And then, you know, just for between cycling through, you know, gaining phases, losing phases, build muscle over time, I eventually got into powerlifting, into bodybuilding, became a personal trainer and a coach, did the bodybuilding thing for 12, 13 years. And then uh, I was kind of sideswiped when I found out I had a birth defect and my heart valve ripped. So that was super cool. So I was stage four heart failure. My heart was three times the size that it should be. Uh, basically, I went from being six weeks out from a bodybuilding show to six weeks out from open heart surgery. I uh, came out of open heart surgery, right? And that's a rodeo in itself. But I, I, I wanted to see if I still had it, right? Because lifting was the only thing I'd known for the past you know, almost two decades. Yeah. And so I ended up competing in a bodybuilding show 11 months after my open heart surgery, you know, winning my class and stuff like that. But just to see if I still had it. Right. So I reversed my heart failure during that time, but it was, it was a good experience, right. Learning curve when it comes to that. And 
have the ultimate excuse back for my clients. So if they, if they had an excuse, I'm like, Oh yeah, I remember that time I almost died and then did a bodybuilding show. <laughs> Top that. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Now I've got a more, even more questions after yeah. that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, intro, which is, there's a lot in there. Yeah. Um, what was the, so what were the, what kind of, how did you do the research on the, on the health stuff at 15, 16? How did, what, what were you doing? You're going to books or were you, how so, where were you finding this stuff? And, yeah. How did it, you know, who, who kind of grabbed you in the beginning? Cause I yeah. think when people start, they don't know where to start. Well, I, I think honestly, back then it was a little bit easier because there was only, you know, a couple places you could really look as far as data. And it was like, you know, bodybuilding.com forums, anabolic mind forums, all those old school bodybuilding type forums. And they would post like study data and stuff, but the internet wasn't as big back then. So now you have you know, 300 million influencers out there. You, you can look anywhere and somebody's trying to put something down your throat. And really back then you had a couple pinnacle people. So if you could get on and you're like, wow, this guy's a you know competitive athlete, competitive trainer, look how good he looks. And then you could watch what he would post, his science, his uh, persuasion on that. So I started reading a lot of those. So it was like Mark Lobliner, um, Oh, Lane Norton, Derek Chorboyos, uh, a couple others like that. And they had put together some good information. So it was just, you know, trial and error, right? This is what they said worked. Okay, I'm going to try it. And then I'm going to spin it a little bit for mine. And it, it's longer, right? When you have to do it yourself, longer learning curve. So if I, I take someone like you, I, I can get you results in you know six months that took me six years to get because I didn't yeah. have to go through like, hey, what works, what doesn't? But it, it was an experience that, you know, I, I wouldn't replace, but that's where I would look. That's where I looked initially. Now, <laughs> good luck, right? There's just so much out there. Well, and there's a lot of ways to approach, you know, health and fitness and, and I guess bodybuilding is a whole other sort of thing that is an elevated kind of physique type yeah. thing. Um, so, um, you know, you got you got to sort of pick and choose. And then how do you, my question always is, how do I know which thing is actually right for me other than using myself as a test tube, which, yeah. you know, I kind of do on a lot of things. I try things and if they work, I keep doing them. And if they don't, I'm like, well, that doesn't actually work for me, whether it's a supplement or a type of exercise. I hate running. I hate yeah. it. Yeah. I won't do it. I'm, yeah. I'll never do it. I've hated it since I was a kid. I don't know if genetically I'm even supposed to be running. I love to walk. I do that. I do yoga. I do those kinds of things. Yeah. Those I found the things that actually work for me. Um, and I think there is some predisposition to certain types of fitness, health, foods, supplements that work and don't work for each person. So it isn't, it isn't a one size fits all is what I've learned basically. Yeah. Well, when you're looking at it, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make when they start getting into, you know, some kind of fitness program is they go with those extremes. So it's like I said, you know, my first thing I did, I'm like, tuna fish is all protein. I'm going to eat this. And I ate it for three days straight. All of a sudden I'm gagging, trying to get it down. Can't eat another bite of tuna still to this day. I'm not eating tuna sandwiches. That was like, whatever, 20, 20 years ago. But my point being, it doesn't take a lot to get a big result. And this is where most people fail. So if you're someone, let, let's say you're going out to eat every day for lunch, right? Getting a, you know, whatever, burger, large fry, and a soda. The only thing you would have to do to lose weight would be to get a diet soda or to get a smaller size soda and a smaller size fry. If you did that, you'd start dropping one to two pounds a week by doing nothing else. So what you really want to look for is where can I get my biggest wins for my smallest input? Because winners win and losers lose. So if you can stack those wins and you're, look, you're looking at it like, wait a minute, that's all I had to do to lose weight? You're not going to quit it, right? But if you're like, oh, God, we're day two and a half of straight tuna. How many more days can I stick this out, right? You're done. You're done before you start, right? Because it's so extreme. So this is why I'm not a huge proponent for you know, fasting, where you give up all food for this window. I'm not a huge proponent for, you know, keto, where you give up all carbs. I'm not a huge proponent for vegan, where all meat's bad, or carnivore, or where our, all vegetables are bad. I like to get a blend of that stuff. So take what you're doing, make small little adjustments. If you get the result that you're, that you're seeking, badass, keep cruising with it. If not, then you make adjustments and refine it from there. Love that because the idea of uh, overdoing it is a certain recipe for failure to me. I, I it's just like it's too much. I, I don't want to do that. I mean, I would I want to be as healthy as I can 
for the what is the minimal amount that I is required. Yep. And, and then if I want to do more, great. But what is the minimum amount? How many days a week? How many hours a day or minutes a day? And what are those things? And if I can figure you know, and I've kind of figured it out for myself. It took a while. But there's things I just, you know, like you say, I, I won't do them. I know I won't do them. And I'm not going to pretend that I will do them because I don't want to do them. Yeah. Well, a lot of the stuff looks easier on paper. You know, you're like, oh, I only have to work out five days a week. But if you spent the last like six years doing zero workouts a week, I I'd start with one or two, right? That's a hell of a lot more than you've been doing. So it's the small changes that you can compound that get you the big result, right? So if there was like 10 stairs you had to hop up, you wouldn't try to jump the whole staircase. You take it one <laughs> step at a time, right? And so that's what yeah. we want to do with any of this stuff. So I find the best ways to chunk it down because people approach it. There, there's two there's two mindsets I typically see. And you have the all or nothing mindset, which you'll see a lot of that in bodybuilding, competitive sports and all that. But the downside is like, if you're a bodybuilder, you show up out of state, out of shape on stage, you get last place. Like you're pictured all over the internet. Like there's, there's repercussions to not getting the goal. But if you're just a normal person, right. And you're trying to look good on the beach in six months, it's not exactly a finite deadline because no one's going to laugh you off the beach. If you show up at, you know, 15% body fat instead of 12. Nobody's like, oh man, look at him. He's in pretty good shape, but not amazing shape. It doesn't happen, right? So you don't have that fear. So I think where a lot of people fail is they go all in, they get this mentality and they destroy everything else in their path. And I'm I'm guilty of this, right? Because that's my mentality. And it wasn't until after doing it for whatever, 15, 16 years at that point that I heard the best analogy for it. And it's, you don't realize what you leave in the wake of your destruction. Meaning if I was trying to cross this room, that was my goal. I wouldn't care who's in my way, man, elbowing people out the way, like, cool. I get there. I'm like, yes, I got my goal. And I look back and everyone's knocked out of the path. So friends, family, whatever it is, work, you can sacrifice a lot for your goal, but you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? And the all or nothing people don't ask themselves that, right? The other thing that happens, the first speed bump they hit, they derail. They don't just circumnavigate it. They derail, meaning it is literally all or nothing. So if they start missing a couple meals, it's like, F it, I'm not going to the gym this week. And it spirals versus the other people. They're like, whoops, I missed a meal, but they're still directionally correct. So the short term, the all or nothing person always excels. But the long term, I see it every time the person who's willing to navigate a little bit more, they, they kill on the long term results and the longevity of it. Yeah. I mean, that idea is kind of great for almost any pursuit, which is build some errors and mistakes into the plan. So when they happen, you're not sidelined because of it. You don't beat yourself up and quit and you just go, oh, well, that's part of it too. I mean, who does anything perfectly? I don't think there's anybody like that. You just can't. Exactly. And so if you kind of embrace a certain percentage, whatever that is, that works of mistakes, I don't even like the word mistakes because I don't think there is such a thing. I think they're learning opportunities yeah. in the most positive sense. Yep. But, you know, it's it's like, um, you know, I have a friend, he had a lot of issues with weight loss and he changed his diet and he, and he goes, but I don't beat myself up when I go off of what I know is best for me. I just go, okay, well, that was not a great day yeah. and he's managed to maintain a, a very healthy weight for a very long time because of that and he said when he adapted adopted that way of thinking that's when he was able to keep the weight off not the rigid well and the, the other thing with with fitness is it's not it's not a finite game like you don't get in shape and you beat fitness right you get in shape and then you maintain your fitness through doing fitness. So I think another thing is, is setting the goal not to be done, but to achieve it and then figure out the minimum level you need to maintain it, which is usually not very much maintenance of fitness is super, super easy. But what it is, is you have to check off that you're still going to have to do something once you cross that finish. Like you don't just get a check. I'm in shape. I got six pack abs. <laughs> I'm back to the donuts, not going to the gym, right? You're going to be on the fitness roller coaster. You do that. So it's, it's well, finding yes. that balance. Well, I know a lot of people, they say things like, well, I ran a uh, five miles so I can eat this donut, yeah. these 10 donuts, whatever it is. It's like, well, it doesn't really work like that. It's not, it's not trade-off time. No. It's and it's, it's lifestyle that's a, change. That's a bad, it's a bad mindset to adopt because 
you look at exercise as punishment then. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you're disciplining your bad action with the food. And when you when you have that scope where you're looking at exercise as a negative thing, you're not going to be super enticed to do it, right? You're going to be like, the dog doesn't want you to come beat its tail, right? So it tries not to do things that it got swatted for. So same thing, right? Essentially, if you're using exercise to give yourself a swat, you're not like, yes, I want to go to the gym. You're like, ooh, <laughs> there's pain associated with that. And you'll find other things to do, right? So we want to keep exercise in a, in a positive loop. And then just, just to kind of calm everyone's nerves, I mean, a pound of fat's 3,500 calories. So even if you go get a Krispy Kreme like normal donut, that's like 180 calories. So unless you planned on downing like 16, 17 of those donuts in a sitting, you're not putting on a pound of body fat from that. So it's the small little things over time that stack up. So, you know, most people, especially if they're older, they didn't get a rapid weight gain. What they did was they maybe gained like 10 pounds a year, which isn't even one pound a month. You're gaining like 0.8. Whereas if you were checking the scale rather infrequent, you would just think, I'm holding water. My shoes are heavy. This is a heavy jacket. The problem is you, just, you had a heavy jacket for 15, 20 years, right? And then you got on, you're like, man, I don't know where this 30 pounds came from. Well, <laughs> it came from you neglecting it very subtly for over the thing. And then they expect it to be off in a week or two. So setting those realistic, but a push for expectations, absolutely, right? You've got to have some kind of deadline on a goal or it's just going to keep kicking the can. But you want to have it where it's, doable but a challenge not overly reasonable and the reason i say that is like if you set the bar too easy what you're going to do is like what all of us did in school right we wouldn't do our homework until the very last night that's parkinson's law so like work expands the fifth time allotted so we want to make sure we're starting ahead of time right not just trying to finish our fat loss in the last week or two of our journey are most of the people that come to you coming for weight loss uh and then moving on to you know, physical fitness as opposed to, you know, in, in, as a, the next step, or is, do you get a lot of weight loss people? Yeah, mostly weight loss. Now this isn't to say that people don't want to gain muscle, you know, look better, perform better. But the thing is to build muscle, you have to be lean. So it's, it's all ratio. So even if you came to me, right. And you were pretty high body fat and you're like, Cody, I want to build muscle. I'm going to go, cool. We're going to lean you down first. And you're like, yeah, yeah, but I want to build muscle cool, we're going to lean you down first. So whenever I look at what a client wants, I look at their end goal. I don't look at what they think they need because they're not hiring me because they know what they need. They're hiring me because they know what they want and they have certain perceptions on how to get it, right? And some of those I got to throw completely out the window because they're hot garbage. Other people have a pretty good idea. They just don't have the application for it. But just to give you some context, I owned a DEXA scan machine for four years, right? So the most highest accuracy body fat test is technically an x-ray machine. They have it in hospitals for bone density, but it will calculate your lean tissue, your fat tissue, and your bone tissue. So I've scanned thousands of people on this thing. And every single person that I watched try to put on muscle that was a higher body fat, wicked spillover, meaning they put on two or three pounds of fat for every one pound of muscle. So by the time we snuck on like five pounds of muscle, you got 10 to 15 pounds of fat that came with it. So by the time you diet that fat off, you're not even going to hang on to that new tissue. And again, there's the roller coaster. They stay the same every year. They go up and down, but the body doesn't look any different. So what I do is I get people lean. Lean bodies are hyper responsive. Muscle cells soak up glycogen, carbs, all that. You build muscle so much easier and at a favorable ratio. So if I get someone lean and we start cranking the calories, get the right stimulus in there, I, I can put on 15, 20 pounds of lean tissue on someone in a year with minimal fat. And that's where we get the best results because now we get that metabolism blazing. I've had people that start out 40% you know, body fat with me. We cut them down to nine and we slingshot them up. And by the time we're done, they're eating more calories than when they were at their fattest. And they're like 12% body fat, right? They still got abs. And they just, it blows their mind because you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm eating more than when I was super chubby but I'm really, really lean. And that's the end game, right? If we can crank somebody's uh, calorie intake ca ca capacity up, they will never get fat again. And that's where we see the best results because if I can have you have the ability to fit pizza in or you almost have to have it to get your calories up, I promise you that we are not, you're not going to be my client again because you, you can't get fat at that point. I did one of those scans. It was pretty fun. 
you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's open. You know, it's not yeah. like a, it's not like an MRI. No, no it's got the, think, just the arm. Yeah. And I was, I was in some pretty good ranges there, uh, according yeah. to the thing. It was, um, I don't even know what an ideal body fat is for me, but it's, you know, it was it, the guy was telling me, "Oh, you're you're in pretty good shape, you know. Oh, yeah. Not amazingly lean, but not certainly not off the charts in the wrong yeah. direction." Yeah, yeah. No, I've seen I've seen some pretty crazy ones on there. You know, people as high as like forty five to fifty percent body fat, which that's a lot. So they got like this, and even then, you know, there there's no such thing as big bone, right? So when you look at even a larger <laughs> person, they they have six pounds of bone, right? And you're like, no, they have no. they might have a larger structure to fill out underneath, but the bones itself only weigh about six to eight pounds on your average human. So that's a pretty consistent. So when you can see the actual X-rays of it, it's it's pretty alarming, right? It, it'll it'll give you some humility when it comes to this stuff. You won't be able to justify your way out of whatever health ailments you're in at that point. Yeah, I had a guy on here who uh, works, uh, he's got a company and they do um, cadavers, you know, uh, uh, body donation. And I said, what's the what's the most uh, kind of alarming thing that you've seen inside human bodies? And he goes, it's the, I forget the word type of fat, but it's the fat, oh, visceral. Uh, visceral fat. Yes. The visceral fat. He said, it's astonishing that there's any room for the organs in some of these obese people. Mm -hmm. um, he goes, that really was a, a mind blowing thing. It's uh, to see inside of a body. And he goes, it really actually helped me to, you know, change my own diet just to see what can happen to somebody. I mean, it's not really the way I want to learn about it, but <laughs> no, but like there's layers, right? So it's skin, you got adipose tissue, which is your normal body fat, muscle tissue. And then that visceral is the fat underneath. So it's like, you'll see the old boys, right? With their bigger beer bellies. And they're like, look, it's not fat. And they're hammering it, right? Because it doesn't jiggle. You can't pinch right. it, but that's that visceral fat. And that's it puts you at risk for heart disease, diabetes, yeah. cancer, all kinds of ailments because it's it's uh it, it has byproducts and it, it's not good to have. The other thing too, you can look at hip to waist ratio. The Dexels will do a android to gynoid ratio. So basically, how large your waist is to how large your hips are. And if your waist is bigger than your hips, it puts you in the upper scale of again heart disease, diabetes, all the health ailments. Well, where do most males carry their body fat? the waist, right? So if you're, if you're a male listener, grab that tape measure, measure around your belly button, measure around your butt. If your belly button is bigger than your butt, you got a problem. It's time to tighten that food up, hit the gym. You got to lose weight because sometimes these health ailments, like you don't, you don't get a pace of it, right? They just slap you in the face. And so you don't go, Oh, I feel like my arteries are 15% clogged today. No, like you don't realize <laughs> that you have a blowout, you know? Right. And so you gotta, you gotta look and if you're at a, a disposition like that that's well within your means of control that's where you want to take the initiative and do something about it because there may be a time if you wait for something to happen that you don't have the capability to do it after and so it's hard to say right because you have to take it from a preventative standpoint rather than a reactive standpoint which most people don't do but i mean you got one life guys you don't you don't get another shot at this stuff so coming from someone who got slapped in the face by something i recommend getting ahead of it rather than uh getting yeah. behind it yeah, because dead lasts a long time, doesn't it? Yep. <laughs> you can't come back from that one. You know? <laughs> now, the, the, let's talk about your your heart situation. You said it was a birth defect, so it wasn't anything lifestyle that you were doing. It just was one of those things that, or was it exacerbated by lifestyle? I'm, I'm curious. That was it, right? So there's this is the fun fact. So I had a bicuspid, almost unicuspid valve. So you're my aortic valve, the main pressure valve off the heart, there's supposed to be three little flaps, right? So they just open and close, tricuspid, three flaps. Mine was bicuspid. So two of them were genetically stuck together, but it was almost unicuspid. So like all three of the flaps were kind of stuck together. And so it eventually tore. And then, so you don't have anything to regulate. So when your heart, you feel that beat, it's opening and closing that valve. So what was happening, I was having blood go in and back out. So I was getting no oxygen in. So my heart function was down to 50 or 10 to 15% with 50% regurgitation. So I was essentially functioning at seven to 10% capacity out of my heart where normal is closer to 60. So I was feeling just like garbage towards the end. But the thing is that valve defect actually affects almost 5% of the population found this out on another heart podcast, but 
they won't list it because that's an epidemic level as far as a disease. But if that was a disease listed in the medical literature here in the United States, they would lose funding to coronary artery disease and all the other goodies that they get to pump people full of. So there's 5% of the population walking around with the same thing I had that could go smooth or they could need a valve replacement and they will have no idea, most of them, until it actually happens. So it's a money thing. Yeah, that part is. Now, with the people that have it, it's more common. Now, you can function well with it, right? So you got to figure most people don't push their, their capacities. So they're not out there like pushing their physical limits. So if you're someone just exerting and all that, you're probably not going to have an issue with it, right? Even if you have like a genetic defect like mine. But I was a 275-pound, uh, 5'10 bodybuilder trying to work with that heart. So I had been in a heart failure basically my entire life and didn't know. And I was just equating everything to being big. You know, I try to go on a run, but ah, I'm a big guy. So I'm like throwing up after, right? I'm training legs. I'm throwing up after. I'm training hard. That's all this is. Because you can justify a lot of things. Because sure. when you're 30 years old, you don't look and go, oh, this was probably heart failure. You're like, oh, it's just me training hard. Oh, it's just, you're right. All these I could tell, uh, that's what I would think. I would yeah. totally think the same thing. Yeah. And so even when my heart was bugging out, when like my valve ripped, so my resting heart rate was up to like 130. My blood pressure shot up to like 250. I didn't know what was going on. They were looking at me for panic attacks because you got to remember, I walk in, I'm six weeks out from bodybuilding show. I'm, I'm 250 pounds at that point at 7% body fat. I'm a very large human. So I look like I'm in really good shape, but I'm over there dying. So they're like, oh, it's probably anxiety. I'm like, well, I am a little anxious right now. Let me tell you, my heart feels like it's not out of my chest, but I don't think this is anxiety induced. I think anxiety is induced by whatever is going on. And so when they started investigating a little bit further, that's where we noticed what was going on. Yeah. Wow. I guess you could have just sort of exploded one day, huh? And yeah, exactly. Ouch. That would have been terrible. Um, well, it's kind of what it was doing from the inside, you know, it kind of looked like a whirly bird on the echocardiogram. So they, they color code your blood. So it's, you know, um, orange and blue, right? Oxygen and not mine just looked like a big swirl. A lot of people that get the heart surgery, they're older. Right. So when I'm when I'm walking around that heart ward, everyone else in there getting cut open is, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old. And I'm in there 30 years old athletic. So it was it was really kind of unorthodox. So I actually have uh, seven plates and 28 screws in my chest because I was such a big guy. They bolted me together along with the sternal wires because they didn't want that thing coming open. And so that was, that was one of the differences. So oh, then the company who did that, they have a pack. I didn't know. I woke up with it in there. Right. I'm like, okay, cool. But uh, they didn't want to split and open. Right. So I remember when I was getting back to training, um, my heart surgeon, in his office, they must've been creeping on my Instagram. Right. And they, I had posted some old video of me, like I was cracking open 315 on the bench. Right. And they actually called me because they thought I was like, uh, you know, 14 weeks after surgery up their bench and 300 pounds. And they're like, you, you can't be doing this. And I'm like, <laughs> trust me, I'm not <laughs> like that, that, that weight will not move right now. But you know, they didn't want me splitting the thing open. Cause that bone takes, you know, like six months to heal up all the way. Yeah. Hey, wow. So you're a little bionic in there, huh? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, the, the heart valve, it ticks because it's a mechanical valve. So like, I sound like a cricket that part's super annoying. So like the only time I get pieces when I'm in the shower, I can't hear or feel it. Every other time of the day, man, is like, really? Oh. oh, yeah, it's like a watch. So it's like, tick, tick, tick. So tick. what about, is, is sleep difficult because of it? For me, yes. So it affects people different. But I, again, I, I hyper-focus. So my problem oh. is that if I'm not tired and I go to lay down, I can not only hear it, but I can feel it. And so you're sitting there and it's like, it's like somebody kind of just happened on you like this while you're trying to sleep. Yeah. It's very, very hard to do. So I literally pass out on the couch every night. Like I, I wait till I'm completely exhausted. I pass out. And then when I stumble awake, because, you know, obviously sleep on the couch is super comfortable. Then I go into bed and I can sleep good. But if I try to go into bed and sleep, I can't remember. I can't remember the last time I've actually fallen asleep in bed to start. It's It's been many, many years. Wow. It's almost like uh, tinnitus, except it's coming from inside uh, down in your chest rather than your ears. Yep, exactly. <laughs> So oh, like yeah. I, I know I, I did buy like I have the headphone things and when I can put enough white noise in, I don't pay attention to the the tick and the vibration. So that does work. But 
man, I got so much gear to get on and sleep. I'm like, it's just easier for me to like kind of pass out on the couch and zombie stumble into bed. That usually works out the best. Well, you know, you seem like a happy guy, so I'm not too worried oh, yeah. about you. No, no <laughs> it, it, it pans out good. You know, my, my wife gets some peace and then I stumble into bed later, right? Wake her up in the middle of the night. So <laughs> <laughs> do you hear a noise? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Luckily she can sleep through it. You know, I mentioned this to you before um, we started recording. Um, I'm at a, well, I'm going to be 70, as I mentioned, and I know that I'm supposed to, uh, and it makes sense to me to do some sort of resistance training, which mostly is with weights, I yeah. suppose, free weights, or sometimes I use, um, you know, uh, stretch bands, which is, yeah. there's some resistance there, but I don't, I don't love doing it. Um, yeah. and you know, how do I get to the point where, you know, how much do I actually, what's the minimum I need to yeah. do? And, um, how can I enjoy it uh, yeah. more? Because I don't know what it is about uh, free weights. I just, yeah. they're, they're heavy. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. that's one thing. And it just seems like I could be doing something, I, you know, better yeah. than with my time, even though when I do it, yeah. I feel a lot better. I really yeah. like it. Well, a lot of it's just, it's implementing patterns, right? And so one of the easiest takeaways, you have to look at the why. Right. So the, the why has to be bigger than your, your disagreement with doing it. So, you know, as you age, right, we get sarcopenia or muscle loss due to age. So after 30, we're declining, you know, one to 2% muscle mass here. So that's usually where weight gain comes in. You feel weaker and it's so subtle. You don't really notice it. So like yes. maybe in your forties, man, you're, you're traveling, you grab that suitcase, you one arm at the end of the thing. You're like, yeah. And nowadays you're going to pick up your suitcase onto the airplane. You're like, <laughs> must have packed more, right? You don't realize <laughs> they're making these things is. heavier than they used <laughs> exactly. to. That's for sure. <laughs> exactly. All of a sudden you're grabbing like multiple loads of groceries, right? Rather just grab it all 60 bags and walking in. And so what you have to look at is the benefits. And so realistically, it does not take much for your goals because you're not trying to accumulate a huge mass of muscle. So a guy like you would be one to two times a week. If you could knock out 30 to 45 minutes of strength training, you'd be Johnny on the spot with that. It would not take much. Now, I always re recommend resistance training versus like bands and stuff. Just be, it's harder to gauge progress with bands because it's not, it's not linear, right? Like you can change the intensity by squeezing. Muscle. It's, it's more complicated. You go to the gym. It's very simple. I did 50 pounds for 10 reps. Cool. If I'm doing 50 pounds for 10 reps in six months, I know I didn't lose strength. If I'm doing more, I know I gained strength, most likely gained muscle. Very dry when it comes to that. And so what you can do is you can play a game called beat the book. Now, you don't have huge aspirations to be on a bodybuilding stage. So it doesn't have to be a lot, but subtle. And then once you get a base strength where you're like, man, I can want every physical activity I need, then you just try to maintain that strength. And then you just kind of switch the order up every few months just so the body stays a little fresh. But the biggest thing is getting a plan. I think that's where most people fail. They don't they don't know what they're doing because we don't want to feel stupid going up to the gym, right? We end up on YouTube fails, any of that. So we'll gravitate towards things we know we can do. And maybe the stuff we need to do is slightly outside our comfort zone. And then once we start checking that box, we can get some momentum. And so once you kind of compound those things in there, it, it goes a lot smoother than you think because then you can chase that feeling. You're like, man, I actually feel better doing this. I'm stronger and all that versus right now it's the pain that's keeping you out. The other thing is in terms of uh, weights, I don't know anything about it. I, I yeah. just don't know. I don't know. Do I use a barbell with two weights on the, on either end? I have some, I have some eight pound, you know, yeah. hand weights that I use. I do those uh, oh, you know, tricep and bicep and different types of curls. Yeah. And I don't do and, and just so it, I hit it to the point where I can't do it. And then I stop, yeah. you know, you know, and I, I'm, I'm not saying I quit. No, it's I silly. actually yeah. stop for the moment and then yeah. I'll do a second set. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I know I'm doing some maintenance, but I don't yeah. think I'm doing, you know, I don't do anything with weights in my legs. Yeah. Ever. No. And so that's, that's usually lack of structure, right? So if you had a clear cut path to do it, the likelihood that you were doing it is much higher. Right. So that's where you want to get that figured out. And usually for somebody starting out, it's, it's pretty simple. You basically will go one exercise per muscle group, two to three sets, you know, anywhere from eight to 12, the joints are giving you grief 10 to 15 reps. So basically you would go up, track your weights with that. And you don't want to neglect the legs being that they're half your body. Right. So we yeah. want to make sure we prioritize those. But here's the thing. If you haven't been training legs, even you doing like a wall sit, that's technically training 
body weight I do squats. those. I do those. Okay, so I that absolutely was what you're do up, those. Right? So okay, yeah. you got them eight pound weights, so you would sit on that wall, grab those eight. So now you're U plus sixteen. So now that wall set has just escalated in intensity. So now we're recruiting more muscle fibers, getting more calorie burn, all the goods, right? So we can start to offset that sarcopenia by getting the activation you need. And so then look at it from a home workout perspective. It's usually going to be in the backside. So the, the back, rear delts, hamstrings, glutes, that stuff usually gets neglected based on home equipment. We usually train what we can see, you know, push-ups, sit-ups, some kind of forward type leg motion, if we even do them at all. But we don't get the posterior chain in there, which is usually what needs the most work, right? Especially if we're desk bound and stuff like that. So that's why I'm always a huge proponent for the gym versus home workouts. Not because home workouts can't be effective, but usually by the time you pay someone like Planet Fitness 10 bucks a month, you trying to stock your house full of the equipment you need. Um, I'd rather pay Planet Fitness because it gets real spendy by like equipment to hit everything. And then you have the luxury of using machines versus free weights. So yeah, free weights are great, but as you get older, right, maybe we don't want to risk the balance issue, stability, yeah. maybe not be able to get back up. And machines have all the safety measures. And so really your, your ability to maximize for minimal risk goes up tenfold. And that's the kind of stuff you want to look at. So even me, I primarily lift on machines now. I don't hardly touch, you know, a few ones here and there. But for the most part, I would say 75% of my workouts are machine-based. How do you learn the proper way to do those things if you go to a gym? Because, I, you know, you go in there, they sign you up, there's some guy in a tight shirt, and you never yeah. see him again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, this is another thing. So when it comes to form, I think people are overly critical on it. So you've got to remember, there's, uh, I'll say this, and I, I mean it loosely, but there's no such thing as form. And you're like, what, what, what does he mean by this? But think, like, if you go to move your couch, you don't go, all right, I'm in the deadlift position. What do you do? You just grab it and go. Now, what form is there to do is, is to minimize, minimize risk of injury and maximize efficiency on the muscles. So, But it doesn't have to be perfect, right? Yeah, if you're injured, you want to be crisp. But here's the thing. If you're going up there, you can walk. I mean, YouTube's got videos of most of these exercises. So to do them at least okay to decent, you could watch a video, you go, okay, that doesn't look too hard. If it's something where you're just, you don't have that, that kind of physical acuity to do it, set up a camera and record yourself doing the set, right? And it's really easy to kind of transpire it there because then you can watch one that's going good and you go, ooh, mine doesn't look like it is. <laughs> Maybe I need to make an adjustment. But for the most part, I think form is one of the more overstated things out there because you're still going to get that emphasis on the muscle. So as long as that form is good enough to not get you injured and activate the muscles you need to, you're probably sitting pretty good. And I wouldn't put a whole lot more thought into it. Now, if you're getting injured every time you go to the gym and you're not getting the muscle activated, okay, maybe it's time to hire a professional to watch you for a little bit because uh, it's getting a little hokey or maybe you've got to be hyper aware of it, right? And record a few more sets and kind of see how you look. Yeah, so I, I guess you could, you know, just probably even one or two times have somebody show you some stuff and then you'd be kind of okay on your own. Well, it's it's a mix too because it's it's the work to the direction. So for someone with more of like a maintenance as a goal, I, I absolutely think that would work yeah. because you just need to know the basics of how exercises work. You don't need to know how to put a program together to hit a specific goal. Now, if you're someone going up there with goals like – fat loss, muscle gain, all that stuff. It's a little bit more in depth than like go up there and the, the guy in his tight t-shirt, right. Is showing you how to do the proper form of bicep curl. You could do that all day, but if you're anyone who's been in the gym. You'll look at people in there a year, two years, three years down the road, less people than you can count on one hand have, have actually got in better shape. So there'll be people going up there five or six days a week that look exactly the same or worse in a year or two. So workouts don't actually steer the body. Nutrition plus workouts steer the body. And that's the combination. So even if you have the perfect exercises, but the diet has room for improvement, you probably won't see exactly what you're looking for out of your fitness program. A lot of folks don't want to give up certain foods. Yeah. I think that's, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to give up my whatever. Yeah. I don't, my, my pizza, basically. Yeah. Or if yeah. You were saying that you, you don't have to give everything up uh to 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 do better yeah. it's yeah well it's, I, it's like I, a it's it's a numbers game right so if you think of it fat is kind of like your savings account right so you have to get 
you have to spend enough energy to tap on that savings. And that's all it is. And so people get associations with food, right? They're like, this is healthy. This is unhealthy. But I could get someone on a meal plan that's all unhealthy food and hits the numbers we need. And they would lose weight tenfold over someone who's just trying to eat healthy. Because at the end of the day, your body doesn't care about that for weight loss. Now for health, inflammation, yeah, that's all that a stuff, different I'm issue. not saying, yeah, different avenue, right? But as far as the numbers go, if you're not getting your expenditure, your burn higher than what your intake is, you'll never lose fat. Now hormones will optimize this and all that. So again, that's a slight side quest, but where most people fail is they try to put themselves on a meal plan or a fitness plan. That's not how it works, right? You have to fit something to you, your lifestyle, your schedule. If it doesn't fit like a glove, you're never going to stick with it and it's not going to work. So again, kind of going back into it, the people that are not working out, eating like garbage, sitting all day, those are my absolute favorite clients to work with. And you're like, what, what, what do you mean? They're so easy because I can literally tighten things up a little bit and all of a sudden they get a big win. Because what, what people don't realize is the average person eats five to seven different foods a week, okay? So this if you're eating you know, fast food, you're eating out and all that, guess what? You still go to the same restaurant. You still order the same thing when you go there. So you don't have this, I eat different. I can't eat the same thing every day. No, because you've been doing that for the last 10 years. What it is, is when you try to switch and eat similar foods every day, you hate the food you switch to. Because if you switch to food you enjoy, you wouldn't be like, I'm having a hot fudge Sunday every day. This is terrible. You're like, oh man, I got a hot fudge Sunday today. This isn't too bad. So you got to make the food stuff you enjoy. So it's kind of like what I do with my people is I have them figure out what they enjoy eating. And then we figure out how to as closely get that to fit as we possibly can. And when you do it, when you do it like that, it doesn't feel like you're giving up things. And when it just feels easy. It's really, really hard to quit. And I found that there's a lot of great substitutions for things that you think are delicious yeah. that are healthier. And that took a little bit of effort uh, yeah. over time. But, you know, I, I, you know, everybody loves a big plate of pasta, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, you don't have to eat wheat uh, yeah. pasta. There's all kinds of alternatives that you can do. You know, I mean, we, we made something the other day. It was cauliflower rice with a little sauce, Yeah, put a little chicken in there. You couldn't tell that it wasn't no, anything. No, you would only be able to, it would be like, okay, maybe a pasta is a 10 out of 10 on your flavor scale. Maybe that's a seven or an eight, right? So it's still not bad. So if you're like, okay, it's slightly different, but my belly's shrinking. Okay. The trade-off's worth it. Now, if it, if it, you know, tastes like you're eating garbage, okay, you would not, you would not keep doing that, but that's what you want to do. Stuff like that, where it's subtle. You're like, man, I love right. pizza. Okay, cool. How can you have pizza? Well, even if you look at it in context, right? Like a slice of pizza is right around 250 calories. So it's not that you can't fit pizza in. It's that when you go and eat pizza, maybe you're consuming it with soda, or maybe you're binge eating the pizza because you're so hungry from skipping meals in the day versus if we increase that protein intake throughout the day, you might get to the end of the day and you start eating pizza. You find yourself putting down two, maybe three slices. All of a sudden that's the right amount of calories you need for dinner anyways. And all of a sudden you're losing weight eating pizza. Like, wow, that's pretty cool. You know what I found over, over time is that some of the things that I loved prior to starting to eat healthy, I can't even put them. I can't, I hate them. They're too salty. <laughs> they're too rich. They taste yep. disgusting because I was addicted to them. Yep. And once I got past the addiction and was eating stuff that was actually healthier, that stuff became a big turnoff to me. Yep. I just, it not, not even mentally, just taste wise. It was just like, I can't, this soup is too salty. I can't eat it. I got to eat something that doesn't have, uh, or sh even sh you know, sugar, which is always, you know, that's, that's sort of public enemy. Number one. Yeah. As far yeah. As yeah. Concerned. Well, and with most people, it's just because you're so accustomed to eating it, it's more that you have a pattern you need to break. So that's where those little subtleties come in because if it doesn't feel like you've changed your pattern, right? Realistically, it feels like you're eating the same foods. You don't have this identity crisis where you're in panic. You're like, oh, like this isn't so bad. And then what happens is it's cleaner over time. So then what you'll find is maybe you go out and have a you know couple of drinks with the guys or you go out and have a big fatty meal at a restaurant, right? Where you kind of just, you go all out on it. Next day you wake up, you're like, oh dear God, why did I do this? It's like, 
you used to do this all the time and you had a tolerance to it, right? Now you can see what this food is actually doing to you because your body's function functioning optimally for once. Yep. <laughs> Oh, that's the noise. Oh, <laughs> the why did I do that? Whether it's alcohol or not, like you're still getting some kind of food hangover. Like, oh, I feel terrible. That wasn't worth it, right? <laughs> so how do you work with people online? Because isn't that primarily what you're doing, uh, which is fantastic. You can reach so many more people that way. Um, how do you do that? Like, I, you know, in term, well, let's say, you know, you were saying somebody showing you at a gym yeah. on machines, that part you can you do that too? Like you have well, machines. That, that part would be trickier, but again, that's where yeah. the emphasis is that it's not, that's the, in the, in the grand scheme of things, right. Nutrition is going to be 80, 90% of our movie. Yeah. Okay. Great. And okay. it'll go into workouts. And again, most people, like if you watch a baby, right. They, they pick something off of the ground, pretty good squat form. Right. So we know how to do a lot of this stuff. And usually it's really subtle cues. So really where I find most of the friction is people tell a story in their head, like they're going to get made fun of. They're going to end up on YouTube's fail. Everyone's staring and laughing. Say, what doing? <laughs> yeah. right? Humiliation. And, and if you, if you want to just watch YouTube's fail and think, could you pull that off? Cause most of them are pretty crazy. Like you, you have to go really hog wild to get it that bad. But Point being is most people don't have form issues where it's it's that crazy, right? They've they've had high school gym class, right? They at least got the basics of movement down, where that's usually not a concern for me. If it is, right, we can always hop on like a Skype, FaceTime, Zoom, any of those. They can record a set, and usually it's it's literally like, hey, I need you to raise your feet up two inches on the leg press. They're like, that's it. It's like, yeah. <laughs> that will make that will make it feel better. So you didn't yeah. need to stand in there and, and do that. But I did the in person for uh, 17 plus years, right? And I hybrided it with online coaching for roughly like the last 12 years of that. And so what I was finding was the people that I was working with online were actually getting in better shape than the people I was working with in person. And this isn't to say that I'm like a bad trainer or anything, but what happens is you 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 kind of become. Um, fitness Jesus to people in person, right? So what I mean is because they're paying for the workouts primarily, they see you as someone they repent their food sins to, but that doesn't delete them, right? So they're like, oh, Cody, I really bombed it. So train me hard today. But again, it doesn't work like that, right? So their emphasis in person tends to go to the wrong things. And so even though like, if I had someone killing it, could I push them harder in person? Absolutely. But is that necessary for 99% of people's goals? And the answer is no. And so when, when we're in or when we're doing online, the key is you do have to have some face time because people will do more for other people than they will themselves. So if I told you everything you needed to do, wrote it down for you and did it, you might or you might not. But if you knew you had to check in with me, we're going to hop on a call. Uh, we're, we're, we're having a conference coming up and you're like, I don't want to look like a jackass like it. I didn't yeah, do anything sure. this week. Yeah. You're like, okay, yeah. And you really make a bunch of excuses or you're going to do it, right? So we can heighten the accountability from doing that, which is what why in-person worked because they had to come see me. So it was that FaceTime more than it was the workout itself because maybe they were afraid of coming in and confessing the food that they had. Mm. And so we could tighten that up. And so I can do all of that stuff online. The, the issues more so rely on the fact that if people are so uh, drinking the Kool-Aid thinking they need an in-person trainer, it's a little bit harder to make that mental shift for, but you know, I've worked with over 2000 people, so <laughs> I've seen it work a few times when it comes yeah. to this. But the, the big thing is you can focus on the primary movers, right? You can focus on the nutrition. You can focus on the mindset. You can focus on the habits and yes, workouts and all that are important, but it's also tracking data. So how I do everything now, like I can see everything because it'll everything I do, it'll sync up to your Apple Watch, Fitbit, uh, Garmin Watch, so I can see your steps, your sleep, your heart rate, any food you track, whether it's MyFitnessPal or in my app, I can see all that and the workout. So I can see all the strength, the data, how hard that workout was for you. If you did it, I get notifications if you miss workouts, right? So it's super creepy because I can see everything. And this is all stuff that I didn't have when I would do in person. Because they, they're they paying for that time, that time block, right? Sure. Yeah. So outside of that, you don't have time to babysit and make sure they made it into the gym on their own. You'll ask them next week when they come in. And then you'll ask them like, hey, how was your strength? And they'll go, good, like every client does. But when you can see the data, it's not always good. So I like to, you know, I like, much as I would like you, right? I would believe you. I would believe the data if the strength was good. And then we would make decisions off that. Because 
if we're dieting down, right, we see your strength dropping. I know we're not putting on muscle. So I might be training you too hard or the nutrition may be off where we're under eating. And so I got to go back to the drawing boards and make some corrections so we can make sure that's going directionally correct. Likewise, if the strength's maintaining or you're increasing strength while we're dropping fat, oh yeah, that's a sweet spot right there because now we're going to hit your goal even quicker and look better by the time we get there. I can hear the enthusiasm and passion in the way you talk about this. So it seems like... Folks, if you're somebody that wants somebody that really cares about what they do, and I'm just going on instinct here and looking at your face and the way you're talking, Cody Watkins seems to be a guy that you might want to contact. I, I, don't, I, I don't I don't do anything but this, right? So if you if you ask yeah. me to do like hand work, fix things, install things, nope. But when it comes to bodies, like that is my skill set, right? So when yeah. it comes to this stuff, I, I gotta I mean, I'm sure there's other good people, but I feel like I got it down pretty well when it comes. I love to- it. That's great. You know, it's a, um, do you have a, a favorite success story? I know you've done worked with 2000 people or whatever, but yeah. I'll bet you got a couple of favorites. And I, I always want to know what's the, the, what's the miracle one that you would just kind of go, I can't believe this person did this. It's just incredible. And it, and it's really on, on the work that they do too. Yeah. Uh, but well, obviously we're, we're, being inspired and, and coached is a way to, um, to improve yeah. Cody, Cody, if you're not, uh, I like these ones, right? So if I get guys that come to me and they start with, so like, <laughs> like that. Okay. That's a big, big person. Huge change, right? Because yeah, God, he's lean is, like uh, yeah, it's a before and after I'm looking at it for you yeah. listeners. How yeah. how big was that guy in the would you say weight wise? Yeah. In the he was about two fifty in the first one. I think we yeah. were around one seventy in the finish, yeah. and then even like even like that, and that's like a two year change. So she lost some weight yeah. in the first year, and then we polished up on the last year and just honed in everything. So I got her to where she was down like a hundred pounds. But the, the best part is, isn't it's not just the journey, right? So my thing is, I don't actually want people as clients when I'm done with them. So, and this is, this is a two part, right? A, you don't want to pay me forever, but B, it is super boring once you reach your goal, right? And I, this is fun for me, right? So if I'm like, cool, thanks for checking in. Everything's exactly the same. You don't like, I don't even understand why you're paying me at that point. So I like to be a coach there to help you reach your goals and teach you the what's, the why's, the wins and the how's. So you don't have to hire another trainer coach again, right? So the cool thing is the people I work with, man, it's like once we get them locked in, like they're still in shape. I haven't worked with them for years and they're still killing it. Like I had another gal, we shaved like 150 pounds off her, right? She'd she'd been large her entire life, like eighth grade, I believe she's around 250. So like it was young. And she's she's out hiking down in South America, like Machu Picchu and all those places and just killing it. She's like 140, 150 pounds now. It's phenomenal because these are people that they weren't into fitness when they started, right? And, and just even walking through the door was a huge step for them. And they're literally a whole different person. And it's it's even how they carry themselves. Yes. And so, you know, people, they're yeah. kind of depressed and slouch. And so when people talk to me, you know, in person and stuff too, they're like, well, are you military? And I'm not, but it's I, like, I carry myself upright, like upbeat, right? And they're, they're like, wow, I used to have confidence like that. It's like, cool. Thing is, you can get it back, Right. You gotta stay, take it, you gotta take care of yourself because you can't pour from an empty cup. So if you're trying to help everyone else and you you're not even helping yourself, it's never gonna work. So if we can put some emphasis back, get your health, vitality, energy, mental focus back, you're gonna crush it and you're gonna be able to help everyone else with whatever you do. You're gonna be a better version of yourself. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me get your card, right? <laughs> So tell, so tell people how they can get a hold of you and uh, what where to go on, on the internet and uh, what other things you're offering to, for people to, if they want to get a hold of Cody Watkins. This is how you're going to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So if you go to Instagram, is the probably the easiest way to find me, Cody Watkins Fitness on Instagram, also on Facebook. But if your listeners, if they DM me the word Freedom24, I put together a training package with this. So it's, it's some of my best works, how to start the macros, where to start your nutrition, some recipes in there, some internal trainings that I do with my clients 
on where to start because that is where most people struggle. Like, where do we take that first step? How do we put this together? And I am very simplistic when it comes to this. I do not like to overcomplicate it. I'm not trying to sell you anything with this. I'm trying to get you in motion, right? And so go through this stuff, guys. You'll get full access to this training portal. It's it's some of my best works. If you have any questions on it, something doesn't make sense, you're wondering what to do, just message me. I'm really, really responsive on the socials and I'll make sure you're taken care of when it comes to that. So you can get some clarity on how to actually get to and achieve your fitness goals where it's going to last. That's fantastic. Well, I so appreciate your time and your energy. And as you said, vitality, I like <laughs> vitality. Yeah. Can't get too much vitality. It's, it's impossible. Well, vitality is the, is yeah. the Holy grail. When, you, when you've been on like knocking on death's doorstep, right? Like you got a, you got a little different outlook on things, right? So uh, <laughs> like you said, every day above the dirt is a good day. Exactly. And, you know, you, and you got a great second act, you know, most yeah. people don't get, have that opportunity and it really does change uh, oh, yeah. you know, you your outlook and appreciation for things. So, um, and you certainly, yeah, that, that comes across very clearly talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you don't forget those moments right so yeah. i i remember even like being in that heart word where you're with all the people that are dying and we're all dying right except i'm dying and i'm 20 or 30 years younger than them so i started listening to them they're like oh i'm so tired oh i'm so this right and i'm like man i don't want to be like that because then you're that guy that you know all the people they're coming around you because they feel bad but they don't want to be around you because you're sucking their life out. So I put on a big dose of sucking up buttercup, right? Cause I'm like, I'm not bringing everyone else down with me. Right. Like this is not their burden to bear. And so I shifted it to where I was thinking of things I was grateful for. And it's a really hard frame to think I'm so grateful I'm dying, but you also get the beauty of perspective, which a lot of people don't get. And so when you're in that little twilight zone, there, there's a glimmer where you can see things that you've never seen before. And that is something that you, you cannot put a price on. And most people will never see unless they've been to that zone. And I remember when I came out of surgery, man, it's like, I took my first breath. It was like, I was completely new. You're seeing things in a completely different light. And I, I was a much better human coming out of it than I went into it. And so like, even though the situations may be dire, it's, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Right. Like, yeah, the ticking yeah. can be annoyed. Right. But it reminds me. So I never forget what I had to go through. So it keeps me uh, dialed in. on course. Yeah. I mean, it's sometimes the worst thing that ever happened to you turns out to be one of the best things or the best thing. And in this case, I think that's probably elevated you to, you know, new heights of, um, well, I'm going to go with vitality again. Oh, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> like I got plugged back in, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for being on the on the show and the best of luck. And I, I know uh, anybody that wants to uh, contact Cody, you're, he's going to be committed. I can tell. Absolutely. It was great having it was great being on here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Much appreciation for you folks listening to The Exploding Human. The website is theexplodinghuman.com. The YouTube channel is The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman. Once again, I want to thank Cody Watkins for being on the show. Check him out at Cody Watkins Fitness on Instagram as well as YouTube. Have a fantastic day. Thank you.